This is Criteria. Hey everyone, welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miris, and I'm here with my co-host James Miefsky. Hello, James. Hi. Hello, Thomas. And we're here also with our uh, guest co-host, Nathan Douglas. Hey, Nathan. Hey, guys. Great to be here. We're here to talk about uh, your favorite director, right? Uh, Andre Tarkovsky. And uh, we talked before about Andre Rublyov, which is his, his masterpiece. That film was on the Vatican film list in the category of religion. And uh, so is today's film, his, his last film, uh, The Sacrifice from 1986. And so um, although we'll be discussing probably all of Tarkovsky's films, I would say later this year after we finish the Vatican film list, um, today we're skipping right right to the final film because that's what they put on the list. So uh, it's quite a strange film. And uh, just to, to give a brief idea of the concept, it's basically about uh, a man who uh, realizes that he has to make a sacrifice to avert uh, the onset of World War III. Anyway, Nathan, why don't you um, introduce this film because you're more familiar with Tarkovsky and uh, probably have a better grip on this uh, piece than we do. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a few things about The Sacrifice that are quite distinctive about it as a Tarkovsky film. Probably the the one you already mentioned, the most uh, famous aspect is it was his last film. Um, he was diagnosed with cancer uh, I believe sometime during the during or shortly after they uh, wrapped production on the film, and then he while he was editing the film he was getting progressively worse in his condition and he ended up uh, he lived long enough to complete the film and to see its release um, on the festival circuit, uh, but then he died you know the same year that the film was completed 1986, uh, so it's of course distinctive for being his last film which brings with it all sorts of aspects of you know final film you know, themes and things. But in this case, <clears throat> or in the case of Tarkovsky, it's interesting in that he clearly knew, uh, certainly during editing, that this was going to be his last film. And so I think, that, you know, you, that certainly colors our uh, approach to the film and, and seeing mm -hmm. certain decisions, certain choices, um, especially, you know, with the, there's a, a, a dedication at the end to his son. You know, there's a very... Um, there's a sense of finality to the film, you know, that, that is of course unique among his films. The other thing I'll mention is that, uh, it's one of two films that he made. It's one of two fiction films that he made in the West after leaving the Soviet union under, you know, quite a bit of, uh, stress and, and controversy. Um, he made the Italian a film in Italy called nostalgia or nostalgia, uh, in, uh, 1982, 1983. Uh, and then this was his second film being made outside the Soviet union, uh, and this was made with the support of uh, Swedish um, arts <clears throat> groups and it was a Swedish production. Uh, and so the film is, you know, mostly in Swedish and it's right. interesting in that <clears throat> while it is obviously visually, rhythmically, distinctively, unmistakably a Tarkovsky film, there are certain aspects of it because it was made in Sweden. It was shot in Sweden. It was even using Ingmar Bergman's uh, own famous cinematographer, uh, Sven Nykvist, uh, he, he served as cinematographer for this film. There's a certain there's certain aspects to it that are not Tarkovskyan, uh, which has kind of marked it out as a bit of a black sheep amongst the rest of his films. 
though I think as we'll we'll get into in the discussion, hoping we will get to discuss this, um, you know, the ways in which it is and isn't, you know, a very recognizably Tarkovsky in film. One nice thing about discussing these films, which are, you know, not always easy to discuss or to comprehend, uh, is that we do have some some comments by Tarkovsky, you know, on the films from his his book Sculpting in Time, which is an, quite an amazing book. Um, and he has a chapter towards the end, <clears throat> the last chapter on uh, the sacrifice. And uh, and I mean, obviously, that it's it's no surprise what what he said the sort of the movie was about thematically. It's about sacrifice, but he said specifically it's about it's about love and sort of loving without reserve. Um, actually, I'll just read this quote from he, him. He said, it's about, quote, the theme of harmony, which is born only of sacrifice, the twofold dependence of love. It's not a question of mutual love. What nobody seems to understand is that love can only be one sided, that no other love exists, that in any other form, it is not love. If it involves less than total giving, it is not love. I like that. I think I think it's the main character Alexander who says every gift involves a sacrifice. If not, what kind of gift would That's it Otto. be? Otto says that. No, do you remember? There's this exchange between them, yeah. and Otto's like, "Oh, it's it's." I think it's Alexander. It's not like but... a huge. It's not like a oh. huge deal. And Alexander's like, "Of course, it's you know every gift." Involves uh, yeah, a it's Alexander. I'm pretty sure it's Alexander. I will say that things clicked a lot more readily on the second viewing than they did on the first. I think on the first viewing, I was getting like shook by the strangeness of a lot of a lot of the elements of this film like to hear your synopsis of it like it's a man who has to make a sacrifice in order to avert world war three right it's like yes that's that's true but isn't always quite so literal as that it's never really um as though that like lands in in all of its absurdity somehow like tarkovsky is able to like keep you suspended in this space between like literal realism and like symbolic sort of dreamscape. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But uh, so that's, that's very disorienting on the first view. Yeah. And I wasn't primed before watching this, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything about what it was about. Um, so I really just sort of like took it as it came. Right. And so, yeah. by the end of the film, I felt kind of like, yeah, a little, a little confused, not really sure what to make of it. But then I, really found that it stayed with me that it that there was like this real staying power mm-hmm. in the film i continued to think about it i felt like very affected by it in a way that surprised me because it wasn't as immediate or or evident as i was watching it but then afterward i just sort of felt it you know i i don't know how to put it i th- if i can just say like i think one thing that makes the film such a strange film and a strange story is, is that, you know, when I say sacrifice, I'm speaking in the, he makes a sacrifice to avert world war three. I'm speaking in the specifically religious sense of the word sacrifice. It's not like there's a concrete plot connection where like he has to, you know, uh, it you know stop somebody from setting off a nuke and he dies in the in the process or something right. like that you know that that's right. that's not what i meant somebody might take that away from what i said but the thing is that it's 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 it puts it in explicitly religious terms and yet the story of the film is not in the context of a religious society or religious people um and uh, it's almost not even clear that it's in the context of like the real world. I mean, right. yes, it is because there's references to Europe in the 1600s or there's... And the you previous know, World War. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, the, and this is a world where Christianity has existed, but it's not... It's it's almost as if uh, this is like somehow like a, a degree removed from reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so, I mean... It has this reli- – it's doing these religious things but in a context that's divorced from maybe the uh, the Christian or the Jewish or even certain pagan notions of sacrifice that we might be familiar with, right? And so it's doing it in a way that seems very strange, perhaps in the way that it was strange when um, – who was the prophet that God told to, you know, sit on a dung heap, you know, and sort of – lament you know or or the prophet that uh uh was told to marry hosea was totally told to marry the prostitute 
like as a symbol, like these kind of strange gestures that like mm. don't exist within like sort of there's that they, they establish their own framework going That's forward, but they don't exist within like a previous like conceptual framework. Yeah, you know? right. And so right. and so it's almost he's almost trying. I think he is trying to sort of recover some of these like primordial realities. I mean, he's even said something to that to that effect. He said that he he, he describes the film as a parable. He said he wanted to invite. He wasn't putting so f forth a specific idea so much as wanting to invite different responses by quote posing question. Or he said he wanted to quote pose questions and demonstrate problems that go to the very heart of our lives, and thus to bring the audience back to the dormant parched sources of our existence. And so he's doing it in a in a framework that is not able to where where our per our perception of the strangeness of it is not um, sort of dulled by familiarity. I guess you could say is is one of the things that's going on and why why the movie seems so so strange. Um, so yeah, it's like he's making this this act of sacrifice, um, but it's ambiguous as to what connection that has to the results. I mean, there's a number of things that happen in the movie. There's the threat of nuclear war. And there's a couple of different things that you could say might be the thing that avert it that he does. Or you could say that maybe neither of them does, and it's just a delusion. Or you could say that both of them do in some strange way. Um, but it's leaving that sort of open to interpretation. Yeah, it's it's interesting that uh, it's interesting that Tarkovsky himself had, wrote about the film as a parable in in those terms, um, because he doesn't necessarily um, go on the record with his other films quite the same way. Uh, and I think as well, there's also evidence of earlier in his career, you know, he was quite resistant to the idea of, um, uh, not, not resistant to symbols because his films all have, uh, intense sort of symbolism going on. But, uh, th there was a, at an earlier point in his career, he was more wanting, you know, the images and the sort of the, the, the dense images that he's making to speak for themselves in, in a more of a mysterious way and not so much in like a necessarily immediately meaningful way though, again, you know, he's no stranger to symbolism. Um, so it's interesting to see him kind of refer to the film explicitly as a parable because it sort of suggests like a, a one-to-one -one kind of, um, you know, there's a meaning to get out of this, which, I mean, when you watch the film, it's like any other Tarkovsky film in that that isn't the case. You know, there's a, there's a whole kind of forest of things happening all at once um, with regards to images and possible symbols and, and, you know, uh, having a multiplicity of, of, um, things come out of, uh, out of a given moment, you know, it's, the film is very rich in that, in that regard, like the rest of his films are. What I think, um, maybe it might help for, for our discussion just to kind of walk through a couple of the few, the, sort of the distinct kind of movements maybe of what's happening in the film. Sure. Because, uh, there, there are distinct phases kind of in the structure of the film. So the film opens with, um, the main character Alexander, who's a, an act, a former actor who's left behind uh, the stage and retired to this remote um, Swedish island, uh, very desolate, very uh, austere. If you've seen any of the films by of Ingmar, Ingmar Bergman's Faith trilogy, like Through a Glass Darkly or Winter's Light, you'll recognize that kind of landscape because it's the same kind of vibe. Um, it's pretty close by geographically. Yeah. It's, uh, he's planting a tree with his young son who, uh, cannot speak because he's had a, a throat operation. Uh, and so we experience this father son dynamic throughout the opening of the film and how this, this main character has kind of left behind the life of arts and culture in order to kind of retreat into, you know, his family on this remote Island. And the, the film opens on his birthday. Uh, as he's walking home, he encounters the postman, this character named Otto, who is this kind of strange figure who's always poking questions around. He's always kind of immediately he questions Alexander, how is your relationship with God? Basically, uh, not so much in those exact words, but, you know, it's a, he's 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 uh, he's a character who's already there to provoke and to start a dialogue. And this starts the film off on this very idea heavy kind of exchange. It's, it's interesting that it's, uh, you know, it's immediately operating in this very, I would say almost uh, a more literary or more theatrical kind of mode um, as opposed to a more strictly kind of image driven mode. And that's interesting uh, for the Tarkovsky fan because uh, Tarkovsky, you know, is kind of well known for being someone who speaks more through images than through words. Mm -hmm. Though, if you watch his films, you'll you'll understand, you know, the words are very important through all of them at certain points. Uh, but this one seems much more, 
you know, for, for lack of a better term, stagey in certain ways, uh, or, or it seems very, very relied on the spoken word and, and on this very like dialectical model of, of, um, ideas being exchanged and, and creating this sort of space of reflection. Um, but what's interesting is how from that opening, and I, I'd love to come back and talk about that opening again, cause I know there's some camera stuff yeah, that we want to talk about there, yeah. but just, uh, to, to continue with the structure that opening, you know, we, we end up at the family house to celebrate the birthday. And that creates this kind of second act where we have this intense, like um, <laughs> surreal stage play basically inside this, this house that's in, it's not very furnished. It's all got all this empty floor space. That's basically the same as a stage. And the way that the, uh, the characters are, uh, we meet his wife, who's a, this kind of unhappy um, uh, uh, housewife who kind of left behind her exciting life in London to marry this actor who then, you know, retreated into, into des- into isolation, um, we meet the rest of his family. Meet meet his uh, his his daughter, who's kind of going through her own struggles. Uh, we meet this family friend, uh, a doctor, a man of science, Victor, who um, may or may not be having an affair with with the wife. Uh, yeah. And so this we we basically enter into this kind of very like, you know, this very this domestic kind of psychological drama. Uh, that again, if uh, comparisons with Ingmar Bergman, like this is very Bergman, <laughs> all these kind of, uh, very up unhappy Swedish people, um, erupting, you know, emotionally volatilely, um, in their bourgeois misery. Um, right. Th- and that's only the first, you know, that's like the first hour of the film. And then all of a sudden jets are flying over, you know, the, the there's this implication that a nuclear war is starting, the power goes out right. and all of a sudden everything's just like world war three seems to be starting. And it's at that point yeah where this va- the the character who up until this point we understand to be an atheist or an agnostic uh is suddenly driven to pray and he makes this this vow to sacrifice whatever is necessary in order to put things back the way they were which then right. launches us into the rest of the film which I won't I won't detail the rest of the film at this point but like the rest of the film kind of shifts into a more conventionally Tarkovsky kind of very dreamy, very um, lyrical, again, much more image driven. It, it turns into the recognizable kind of Tarkovsky that we, that we all know and love uh, where it becomes this kind of stream of imagery and impressions and moments that then culminates in the final um, act that the character does to fulfill yeah. his vow. This is a spiritual uh, s- struggle. This is a spiritual awakening. This is a man going from, like basically being spiritually flatlined to you know, a, a, an experience of conversion. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, if I had to point to another like big theme in the film, other than the sort of the love and sacrifice angle, it's, it's this like sort of past, present, future angle that the film refers to. And this, this kind of, when they're talking, when they, when uh, Otto gives Alexander this birthday present of an old map of Europe from the 1600s, you know, they're talking about, you know, what it was like to live back then, or did they, it's nice that they must have been nice to think that this is what the world actually was, or, uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. things like that. And, 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 uh, and then, of course, with his son, whose name is Little Man, you know, there's the question of, there's the question of the future, you know? Right. Um, and I guess maybe if you, if you pointed to another theme, it would be like the meaning of like words or like the difference between words and actions, the significance of words, something like that, because the film starts out with this, this dialogue of, uh, I was having a really rough time at the beginning of this film because there's this really long dialogue between Otto, um, and uh alexander and book ended by monologues by alexander where he's just talking to his son and his son's not responding both because what he's saying is like not something that whatever how old that kid is six or eight or whatever could respond to and also because he can't talk because of his throat operation um and the stuff most of the stuff that he's saying um especially after the dialogue with otto is just so it just feels so like arid and like empty and like I was like getting for I was like, oh my gosh, Tarkovsky really can't be expecting me to like to care about what this guy's saying. Like, can he? And then like it, soon enough it becomes clear that like no, we're expected to see it as kind of like useless, pointless, like, you know, sermonizing, uh, because because he uh, at a certain point breaks off and it's like words, words. I'm I mean, I'm sick of talking, you know, why doesn't somebody stop talking and start acting? And then that that becomes what the film is about. Actually, the first like 
really mysterious thing that happens in the film is him his sudden collapse. Yeah, it's the first of a number of like sudden collapses right. that happen because Otto randomly collapses too at, right. at one point, not right. too too long after that. That that's the first point where you get a sense right. of like, oh, this is going to be like a weird like exactly mysterious. because because then the film progresses with no feeling no need to explain right. what happened afterwards or why that happened. Yeah, and then and then there's a lot of stuff that sort of you know estranges. Uh, like stranges yeah. up things. His dream sequences. Yeah, yeah. But and we, the color we already mentioned too. like how yeah. the house is furnished or not furnished, how his wife is dressed, how people are speaking to each other and uh-huh. moving around. You know, it's like it straddles realism, but it's not pretending to be that. So, you know, it, it really does create the sense of it being its own world. Every film really does have its own world. I think that this is, this is, um, just just like uh, you know a, a a truth of uh of storytelling is like you're always creating even if it is meant to be like quote unquote realistic you're you're creating your own world and and tarkovsky here does so i think you know in his characteristic way but also in a way that's just very um yeah very unique very uh i don't know uh it's it's something that that you don't see a lot of filmmakers really attempting to do, but you you really do feel like you're suspended in this state of uh, I don't know, yeah, like the uncertainty of of where you really are, you know. It's yeah. a it's a very hypnotic effect to the film, yeah, or at least it's working towards that. I'd say it doesn't necessarily always maintain it, but um, one of the things I think I wonder if this helps with context and i would say in tarkovsky's earlier films you see a tendency um to either kind of go all in on realism or to go all in on lyricism and impressionism and so the all in on realism actually well, this theory doesn't even really hold up from the beginning uh in a certain sense in that he's always, he's always kind of bouncing between the two ivan's childhood his first film is like you know very realistic and it also plays with lyricism andre rublev is this like plunge into kind of historical realism with with aspects of lyricism but it's a it's a much more realist focused work you could even say that about solaris even though it's a science fiction film it's this very realist kind of science fiction film and then from from his next film from mid 70s onwards mirror up until the end up until the sacrifice it's kind of all about impression impressionism um images and and montage working more um uh in a more impressionistic way to repeat myself um Sacrifice kind of stops that cold in its tracks from the beginning because it's not, it's, it's actually, uh, the way I would put it is that it's, it's playing with, uh, the aspect of kind of the modern artistic crisis of, you know, kind of trying to reach for something more real, but doing it through art, through the, ex- the exposing of the artifice to doing it, you know, doing it through, uh, seeing the, the structure, seeing the construct for what it is. He's very much operating in that mode, I think from the very first frame and, and to sort of illustrate that, I want to just walk through that opening shot because I think it is a, it's a really extraordinary example of someone kind of, kind of working through different formal concerns, but in that opening shot, you know, which starts at the seaside and then eventually moves, in, you know, inland into the grassland. Um, we have this, you know, we have this very kind of uh, stuffy literary, uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. It's just this very kind of like high toned, um, you know, this is a film of ideas. You know, this is this is uh, characters or intellectuals who are who are coming from different ends. This dialogue with Otto, where they're talking about these, you know, you're, you're plunged right into this kind of space where you're just you're trying to get your bearings, and it's it's very hard to kind of to get to get those bearings, and and but at the same time. Um, and this becomes clear on, on repeat viewings, you know, every line spoken is actually kind of telling you something about, about the characters, but it's, what's interesting is that we go from this, like kind of this sort of, uh, this dialectical conversation, uh, at the same time, the camera's moving. There's two things that are happening that are, that can only happen in a film. First is obviously, you know, the the camera is moving in a certain way, tracking with the characters. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, But before that, there's also the aspect of the little boy. And so little man is played by, you know, like a five or six year old boy. Uh, Obviously you can't, you know, hone a child's performance 
uh, to be exactly a director can never like hone a child's performance to be exactly what he wants it to be. And there's always going to be some aspect of, of contingency of, of accident happening. And Tarkovsky, you can totally see him working with that in this scene as this conversation unfolds. And as they're walking away from the water, Alexander has his son. He's like, Oh, you forgot your rope. Go, 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 go get your, your toy rope. So the boy runs out of frame. And that's a very interesting thing because right in the middle of this, again, very theatrical kind of dialogue, all of a sudden Tarkovsky's made room for the inbreaking of realism. Like he's, he's, he's left something that's completely, I mean, it's within his, his control to a certain extent, but it's not completely within his control the way that like a theatrical dialogue uh, is. And so now we have this kind of suspense where it's like, there's this, there's this third agent. We have our two actors and then we have our child. And that creates this this like incredible kind of suspense because that child, even if he's following what he's told to do, is still going to be some, there's going to be some accidental aspect there that's always impacting the scene. And you see this play out through the rest of the scene, even though the child is following, you know, what he's supposed to be doing, there's still that aspect. Again, there's this, this aspect of the unknown, of the uncanny, of, of just something, something right. unexpected could happen, even within the framework of something that's like very, very tightly scripted and directed. Um, and that tension, I think, runs through the whole film, even through the even, even um, stagier, more theatrical parts in the house. Like there's, there's this constant kind of back and forth between uh, Tarkovsky leaning into the modern, like, uh, self-aware tradition, uh, but then also creating these like entry points for the shock, creating these entry points for the the eruption of something that cannot be controlled, and then gradually that starts to. I won't say it takes over the film, but I mean, I guess you could say really the the, the it does. I guess it does take over the film in the sense that the finale of the film is, you know burning down a structure uh in one take <laughs> that can't right. be controlled uh right. beyond a certain point so i don't know I, I, again that's just to me there's something very interesting going on with he's not simply playing into this like modern brechtian kind of like a, you know self-aware uh dramatic tradition like he's he's constantly doing cinematic things with the film form to like create the space for the unexpected for the real to break through and i don't think you see that Add, like to the same extent in any of his other films, they all kind of lean one way or the other and, 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 you know, commit to lyricism or commit to realism. But this one is, is just like caught in this tension between the two. And that's one thing that makes it, I think, absolutely, absolutely fascinating uh, to experience and frustrating too, because it's, it's a, uh, it's very hard to kind of settle down into a pattern because you're constantly the pattern is constantly changing, I guess. So I'm curious to right. get your, I don't yeah. know, I'm curious what you guys, what you guys make of that. Well, no, uh, that's, that, that, that puts it very, very well. I think that describes what I was trying to describe in like my broken and not very successful way. Um, that puts a much, much better description on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you mentioned that the boy going off screen to get his rope and then come back on as the, as the camera kind of continues to move left, you know, it also, you know, touches on that, you know, that's the sculpting in time aspect, as Tarkovsky called it, you know, the art of cinema being I haven't read the whole book, but my impression is he talks about the the art of cinema is is unique in its ability to work with time as a medium. And so uh, when you have these moments like uh, uh, them going uh, him going off screen and coming back in or uh, later on when. Um, just these little things that people have to do, like when um, they're about to leave the house to go on a walk at the end of the film, and uh, they send the maid, uh, Julia, back in to get little man uh, or to, to look for him. And um, it doesn't really amount to anything, but but it's just one of these it's just one of these little de little detours or things that make they, they make you feel the passage of time mm. in a more like concrete way. Uh, somehow. Or, or even um, with with the camera in the opening shot, uh, the camera eventually, the, the, you know, the, the very slow. I shouldn't say not very very slowly because it's not that long a shot, but like, but but slow enough to not perceive that the camera and the characters are actually getting closer to each other. Like you, you can yeah. sort of generally get it, but as, all of a sudden, at some point, they're actually going to cross each other's paths, and they're, the characters are walking on a diagonal angle to the camera's path right. that is so gentle that all of a sudden 
uh, it's just uh, to me it's an extraordinary effect of of yeah, realizing like great. we are about to convert we audience we our perspective we are converging with these characters we're about to collide um and he does it in it's such our first a, time really seeing them up close and seeing their faces yeah and and it's uh, um I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what to say about it, except that it's just, it's a remarkable, um, not, not simply an effect because it is this, it's just a remarkable feat, you know, that there's, um, something there that he's trying to, to show us, you know, that only, uh, only film can do, you know? Right. And, and he's yeah, not yeah. trying to not like, like many who would, um, use long takes or, or whatever. He's not trying to, show off i think he's not he's not trying to like beat you over the head with the technical prowess of it it's a very gentle kind of uh, yeah there's several uh, there's several long takes in this one of my favorites is when uh he comes back to the house and he starts basically preparing for his sacrifice and he's like you know going through and clearing off the table and moving the cars and stacking chairs to create his bonfire this is all handled in this very gentle single take moving from one framing spot in one room to another. And it's also so procedural, which is really interesting in the context of such a strange and surreal film to have these procedural moments where he's like, okay, don't want to damage the doctor's car. So I'm going to get his stuff, put the gun in the case, put the case in the car, drive the car away, come back to the house. You know, that's like this whole thing. It's not really, doesn't necessarily have any sort of like you know symbolic or like right right you know, right yeah. super, uh, you know preternatural impact right. you know but uh, but it somehow just adds to the the sense of yeah the sense of time at the very least right mm-hmm. yeah no should we bring in no, the no. like the 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 actual first image of the film um because before this scene we've been talking about we get the opening credits and we've got this this image that's a recurring image throughout the film which is a uh, close a detail. Uh, multiple details of the painting, an, an unfinished work by Da Vinci, um, the adora- Adoration of the Christ Child by the Magi, um, which we come back to multiple times in the film. Um, and uh, also the music, um, which is at the beginning of the end, beginning and end of the film, is. Um, what is it? Dick. It, 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 yeah, so I'm it's Matthew's passion. Yeah, and so and I'm told that that's the part where Peter is lamenting having denied Christ. Yeah, yeah. It was it was God's really mercy. funny because um, I when I like first really started to get into sort of like auteur directors and and uh like art film. Um, I remember watching one movie and just getting like really excited and just being like, I was in my little dorm room and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like. I'm going to make a short. I'm going to make a short film like right now. And so I like got oh, out. I remember this. I got yeah. out my phone and I like shot this little like two and a half minute thing. I just started doing like like this montage of like stuff that I could see from my room. And I like put it to like this aria. And oh, Barmay I didn't remember like, that. It yeah. was a different version. But I, 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 you know, and it was there was like a lot of slow pans and dwelling on images. And the music is really evocative. Um, and when I started this movie, I felt like so artistically validated that I had had like the same sort of impulse as Tarkovsky. <laughs> right. right. Real ones yeah. 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 And then the music. So yeah, I've got that, that recurring image, but the music is also interesting because I think that music only happens at the beginning and end of the film. And yep. then, but the rest of the film is also very like economical in its use of music and very strange because Austere, you're hearing, I would say. yeah, yeah you're, a lot of, for a lot of it, you're hearing like these strange sounds in the background and you're not sure if it's actually soundtrack or like something that's happening like right elsewhere on the island well, there's these strange like yelpings and like sort of strange female vocals and like yeah the way that it's stuff. handled in the in the mix yeah. is very much creating the impression that it's in the world right and and in fact sometimes characters respond to the sound and other times they yeah. don't sometimes they pause and listen and other times they don't and and so yeah very weird use of music too because yeah. even with the spanish or not spanish the japanese flute um uh bit uh even that begins as what is that diegetic is that what it's called when it's when it's in the scene yeah Yeah. um it begins as something in the scene and then it becomes soundtrack right you know so it's it's like even there is this sort of straddling between a kind of realism and and 
lyricism or whatever. And there's also there's also some sound, just regular sounds that kind of remind you of the the wider space that they're in. Even when they're inside the house, you're sometimes hearing. I think it's like a ship's horn mm. in the background, yeah. right? Because they're near the water. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's that's very interesting as well mm-hmm. because it, rem- it like it makes it feel mundane. I, mean, I think I think you hear it even after they they get like the radio or the TV the TV broadcast about you know. Uh, don't panic, stay in your homes, you know, something bad is happening, basically. Uh, you still hear this, like, this ship's horn every once in a while, and it sort of returns... It, it re- from the effect that it had for me was to like just ground it in this sort of like normalcy and these like mm. mundane sounds that you would hear, hmm. you know, from your house. Yeah, but at the same time, there is like a sense in which this place feels like it's sort of... It, it exists outside Porous. of... No, no, what I was going to say is that it exists outside of time <laughs> okay. and, and is its own sort of uh, ethereal realm. Um, it's Because isolated. you never see, yeah. yeah, it's isolated. It's this like barren landscape. You never see anybody else, not until the end when the ambulance arrives. But even that ambulance is kind of very weird and odd. Like who called this ambulance? Um, but uh, but we have uh, Monty, Monty Python, the end of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Honestly, yeah. when like this, suddenly these like cop cars just come yeah. in. It's surreal, yeah. But yeah. but yeah, but so so you know you you feel like almost like you're you're in like uh, like 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 starts no exit or something oh it's like so that. you know it's, it's so like, austere and it's 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 to me the the feeling i have watching it is 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 scraping like this film scrapes you and and i, I don't say that i hope not to scare off anyone who's you know <laughs> it, on the fence about watching it please watch it but it is it it's a scrape and i say this as like tarkovsky's one of the greatest like but it's it's truly going to the depths of something and and everything is geared towards this effect of uh, honestly in a way it's it's almost like a uh, it's a kind of death of of mise en scene almost like even in in the in the sound and the sparsity of the sound and the sparsity of, the, of music and and throughout the film the color of the film like when, once the World War Three is starting the color drains out of the film um, I found that incredibly yeah. de- like it's incredibly depressing like on a an a, 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 a right. affective level like it's um and it's significant you know there's a reason for it but yeah. this is truly um uh there's a kind of death of the senses that that this film is posing and is making you undergo which I think is quite interesting because um Tarkovsky is such a sensually rich filmmaker Mm. all of his films are he loves music he loves art he loves color like you look at any of his other films they're so rich and dense with texture and imagery and 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 music and this is just like the the end of all that you know and yet at the same time it's almost like he can't help himself you know the movements are so choreographed and where the camera lands and the framing you know and and things entering and exiting the frame and it it feels so um uh you know, visually rich in that sense, even while at the same time being very sparse, very scraping, very um, progressively bleak, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it is, it's just a fascinating film um, of, of, of like these paradoxical elements. Um, One thing we could mention is that there's three, there's sort of like three color modes for the film, really. There's like this sort of realistic color. Um, then there's the, the, the color of dream sequences, which are, I think, fully black and white, or at least, or at least seem to be. Um, and then there's sort of an in-between state where it's just a super drained state, which are like the real world sequences, basically in between. Yeah, the the yeah. when they they hear about the, the potential of nuclear war and basically yeah. when the character wakes up in his bed but, near the end. But of the even film. already by the time we've arrived at their home, it's already become significantly gloomier Mm -hmm. you know like even before the war do you think in terms of color grading yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i think i no please go ahead you don't think so no i don't think so maybe it's just done with lighting maybe it's it's just yeah i think it's i think it's a largely lighting thing probably it's just that the the interior of the house set is so like there is a you're you're right in the sense that there is a monochromatic aspect to the set like it's very brown it's very you know it's it is yeah, totally I mean, obviously it doesn't go full monochrome but yeah. like i do but it, it, but it, it did strike me as being like 
so there is a there is a shift there. I think uh, I think a lot of it is more yeah to the just the gloom the gloominess is more to just being inside versus out. Sure. Um, sure but then right. that, but it's still even then it's still removed. It's still it's still recognizably kind of a realistic like look compared to the desaturated you know the more monochromatic mm -hmm. more sepia i don't want not really sepia but there's there's like you know that that's sort of like just again i don't know how to describe it but like the life drains out of yeah you know yeah, once yeah. once the once they're watching the tv and then from that point on um it's different it's the sickened it's the sickened kind of image you know mm -hmm. um, right i don't i don't i'm not inclined to try to like solve every weird little mystery that this film offers us. I mean, there's some images still that I just have no idea what the point of it sure. is, you know? Sure. But um, maybe we can look at some of the, the big, you know, sort of the big important sort of uh, motifs. I mean, I, I brought up that painting because it seems to like encapsulate a lot of the different motifs. I mean, first of all, that we had the Magi bringing gifts, uh, obviously like that, that, Com connects with the sacrifice idea, the discussion of gifts. You've got the aspect of womanhood, which we haven't even really gotten into uh, yet, uh, with the, the Virgin Mother, and we've got you know the Christ Child, uh, and where there's some resonance with him and the little man, of course, especially because the little man is connected with this. In the beginning was the Word idea. At the beginning. Uh, when Alexander is talking to him, he says, in, in the beginning was the word, but you're as mute as a dumb salmon or something like that. Because, again, his son can't talk. The final lines of the film are the, the, the little man's first time speaking. And he's back. He's back at the tree that they've planted, which uh, which is, is sort of explicitly laid out as a symbol of faith in the film. Um, and uh, he says, in the beginning was the word. Why is that, Papa? And so, I don't know, if you're comparing... If, if you're connecting to to him to the Christ child um, and in the beginning was the word, you could say, you know, there's a sort of there's a sort of new birth or a beginning for this this boy when he speaks these words, when he's been silent for the whole film. And th that's a pretty profound question that he asks, you know, with his first word, words in the film. So um, I think there's there's a clear connection being made there. And then there's the character we haven't talked about at all yet, which is Maria, um, who is one of the, the serving girls at the house. Um, and later on, what happens is that Alexander makes his prayer. He, he prays the Lord's Prayer and then makes this offer to God to sacrifice everything in his life if everything can just go back to how it was, if, if this situation can, can be averted. And... Uh, and he and and he importantly said he mentions he specifies I'll give up my house I'll give up my 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 family everybody I love I'll even give up little man, and uh, then shortly after that Otto comes and tells him, <laughs> you have to uh, you know you have to go to Maria you have to go to Maria and he doesn't know what he was talking about and he, and he says oh she uh, you have to go you have to go see Maria she lives in the church uh, this old uh, disused church and and you have to. Uh, if you, she's a witch. I found out she's, she's a witch. And if you, if you go lie with her, she's, she's a witch in the, she's a witch in, in the what best sense. sense. Yeah. She's a witch in, in, in what sense? In the best is sense. And, and he says, if you lie with her and if you, if you, uh, if your only desire at that moment is for all of this to be over, it will be over. And so he goes to Maria and we can, discuss that scene in more detail later but he goes to her they lie together in a way that you could say is it a sex thing it's not quite clear they um, levitate they sort of levitate know. it's they're unmoving sort of it's uh some people have interpreted this differently anyway but some people have interpreted it as like juxtaposing a pagan um sort of sex magic idea uh against the christian sense of sacrifice because the next thing that happens is that he burns down his house and that's his sacrifice. And so there are these, there are these two things and it's not clear if they're sort of juxtaposed against each other or working together. Um, 
And so uh, that's kind of the one of the weirder aspects of the, the film is that Maria being referred to as a witch and you have to go lie with her. And I, we'll, we'll have to discuss that in a little more detail to sort of try to make anything out of it. But but those are so, some those are some of the other big motifs in the film. And somebody pointed out in a review that I read that at the end, when the house is burning, Maria appears on the left and he goes and kneels before her. And the, the person I was reading uh, compared that to the posture of the uh, the Magi before the the Virgin Mary in the uh, in the Leonardo painting. Yeah. So yeah. So there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't know which where you want to go from there, but those are. I just wanted to sort of lay it all the things we hadn't mentioned out so we could sort of delve into them. Um, yeah. There's so much there, and I don't know if we'll we'll even be able to sort of shed light on it, but. Um, it, it, one of the things that um, is worth mentioning about Tarkovsky uh, is that levitation is a is a recurring motif in his films. Um, sometimes he has an actual uh, diegetic reason for it in Solaris, which takes place in space, mostly on a space station. There's a moment when the gravity stops and the main the main characters, the a man, a husband and wife, they are embracing. Uh, and they, they levitate because they, they lost gravity, but it's, it's actually, you know, it's kind of this uh, pivoting point in the film of, of the meaning of their relationship in the film mirror Tarkovsky portrays memories of his own childhood, you know, filtered back through this, this poetic sensibility, um, including, especially to do with his mother. And he depicts his memory of his mother, you know, or not so much his memory, but he depicts his mother with this kind of levitating, he depicts her levitating. So for Tarkovsky, like the levitation is kind of this recurring motif of the holy and of this, at least that's how it's conventionally been read. Um, which leads me to, to see the, at least the, the act of him lying with Maria, they, they levitate, you know, in this very kind of immobile, um, embrace, you know, to me, that is, that is Tarkovsky signifying a spiritual reality like it's just, it's consonant with the rest of his work. Um, uh, the question of how, you know, how to sort of map it out from there and all the possible kind of implications of that. I don't really know what to say because it's such a very mixed up, uh, right. It's a very dense thing. Right. So, but I think that's worth mentioning at the outset that like, I think as far as like what are Tarkovsky's intentions in that scene, he's trying to depict something numinous. He's trying to depict something mystical. Yeah. Um, which I think is pretty clear from how it's played. And it's out. worth mentioning that we come back to this image of the Leonardo painting of the Madonna and Child and the Magi right before um, Alexander go decides to go to Maria's house, which is in this old church. Um, he tries to go see her. So there's another connection of her with that with that image. So yeah, I mean, maybe maybe we can talk about that. That scene has a lot of meat to it, so maybe we can talk about that scene a little bit. Um, so he goes to her house, mm -hmm. and um, well, uh, let's talk about how she's introduced actually first. And again, I owe this to some of yeah. these observations to uh, a, a Christian writer who was reviewing this film on uh, Letterboxd, um, uh, who pointed out that uh, at the very beginning she's being asked by is it Susan, the name of the wife. Um, uh, anyway, uh, Alexander's recall. wife is asking her to set up things for his birthday party before she goes home for the night. And she asked her to do things that have to do with, uh, what is it, uh, candles, a plate, and Plates. wine. wine. And she wine. just slowly repeats, like as a, like as almost like a list of tasks. Candles, a plate, and wine, like staring directly into the camera. And, um, you know, this, this reviewer pointed out, these are sort of liturgical, you know, <laughs> liturgical implements. Yeah. Um, then when he goes to Maria's house, um, we see all of these religious images in, in her house and we see, um, uh, one of the first things that happens is that his hands are dirty because he had biked there and he had fallen into the mud. And, and she, there's this long sequence of her helping him to wash his hands, obviously has, a sort of liturgical significance as well. Um, any of you feel, feel free to jump in at any time as I'm going through this scene. Um, One thing I just want to point out when Maria is introduced uh, to go back to, to them being in the house uh, and she's getting her instructions, there's even a liturgical aspect of repetition to the instructions where 
um, you know, she's asking to, uh, can I go home now? And the, you know, capricious wife is kind of seems to almost be like inventing reasons to d detain her. Um, but she goes through this, oh, no, don't forget to warm the plates. Uh, then you can go. And then, okay, warm the plates. Oh, no, then also light the candles. Okay, light the candles. Oh, then also decant the wine. Okay, and then she repeats plates, candles, wine to us. And what's interesting is that she breaks the fourth wall in that moment, which is, you know, um, it's again, they're talking about the uncanny, like she basically looks right into the right into the lens yeah. and repeats that to the uh, to us saying, you know, so there's this kind of sense of like, why? <laughs> anyway, I, I sure. couldn't like just explain that in a flat way, but like, it's like, you know, this it's this like potent moment of wake up, something's happening here. Yeah, that is kind of beyond words. Yeah, that breaking of the fourth um, wall then, happens in in two other places that I can count. Um, when he gives his prayer, he he delivers it straight to the camera, um, and then mm -hmm. later at the very end, uh, when his wife is kind of like ranting about why Australia, I don't understand it. There's a portion of that that she delivers straight to the camera. Right. Um, don't know what to make of of, uh, of that one in particular. Right. Uh, but, it it but, may may or may not be breaking meaning to break the fourth wall, or it might just be. The I mean, it it, it doesn't really matter what its meaning is. Its effect is that it breaks it. They're looking straight into the camera, and you become uh -huh. immediately aware that you're being looked at by these uh -huh. actors. You know, so like the effect is that you're looking into the camera. I mean, you know, it's yeah. it's it, it breaks it. Um, so it 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 it's confrontational. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it makes you like self-aware, you know, it draws attention to the artifice. Um, you know, it's, it's like, it's such a sacrosanct law of, of film acting. Never look into the camera, right. you know, um, you can look close, right. uh, but, but, right. it, you know, so when well, it happens, it's, it's, analogous it's immediately noticeable. Yeah, go ahead. It's analogous in a way like to not to, you know, obviously film is not liturgy and I don't want to draw too many, I don't want to imply, you know, that it's closer to it than it is, but there is an analogy between the ad orientum posture, uh, which of course, um, Tarkovsky, you know, being at, so, at least at the end of his life, he was, um, we have reason to believe he was a faithful Russian Orthodox Christian, um, you know, he, that the posture he would have been familiar with at the liturgy would be with the priest, you know, in the, in the Holy of Holies, um, only coming out periodically to address the congregation, you know, wisdom, let us attend. Mm -hmm. And the breaking of the wall very much functions like that in the, in this setting. Right. It's, uh, um, well, I thought of that when you mentioned the repetition know, I, yeah. in that one scene, because that happens, of course, if you ever attend the Latin mass, there's things that the priest does and then he sort of does them again for the congregation's uh, benefit, you know, like the uh, the, the right. multiple times doing the confidior, uh, or no, no, not the not the confidior, yeah. but the the dominant 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 dominant. yeah, yeah. For for instance, so um, there there are yeah. instances of that um, where it's yeah, and it even and then again in the in the Latin context, like the you know dominus vobiscum turning to the Lord be with you to you know the turning around to address right. the the congregation, you know again it has that fourth wall kind of effect. Um, I think he's doing something similar with uh, with with Maria yeah. and with the prayer. Yeah, and I um, and I I do take Tarkovsky at his word that that there are not one to one connections that he does not intend for these to be like direct symbols. But it's also clear the tool set that he's working with and the sort of the the, the religious, yeah. aesthetic, artistic sensibility that he's, you know, bringing to bear in crafting these really densely imagistic and symbolic moments, you know. So so I think that uh, that that, you know, it, it's I, I would I would stop short at saying like, oh, yeah, Maria represents the Virgin Mary. And oh, yeah, this represents uh, the liturgy. But I think it's clear that that is the toolbox that he's working with right. and that he's trying to yes. explore spiritual themes and he's using what he understands, you know, as as an Orthodox Christian or we suppose so, you know. Can I, so that that I just this puts this put just put me onto a line of thought that I really want to ask you guys. Um, 
while watching this film, you know, and, and sort of being aware of the Marian resonances of the character Maria and just what's happening. But like, for me, there's a resistance to really receive it as an allegory. There's a resistance to receive it again as this kind of like, oh, this is this is fully symbolic and significant of of a fully kind of Christian experience that this that this character is undergoing. Um, but what it makes me wonder is why is there why is it so easy to kind of resist that, but not um, in say Lord of the Rings, you know, there's all always the the discussion about Aragorn as like a Christ figure. He's not literally a Christ figure. He's not directly one to one of Christ figure. But there's all these Christ symbolic, Christly symbolic aspects of Aragorn that are impossible to ignore. And they to know them is to enhance your your understanding and experience of what Tolkien is doing in the fullness of the work. But I find that much easier to accept. Sort of like the multiplicity of that. I find that much easier to accept in the Lord of the Rings than I do in the sacrifice. Uh, I and I'm, I, I just yeah, don't, I, think, I don't know I why. Piety, I don't know. <laughs> I think I think piety wants me to to not like go into that too hard, you know. Right. Where, whereas with Aragorn, I have no problem really uh, thinking about him as a Christ figure because there's nothing that like there's nothing really impious about that. Right. But but here, because she's described as a witch, because he has to go and lie with her, you know, like it's not. Even when they do, you know, quote unquote, lie together, everything that she's saying to him is very, you know, kind of, kind of uh, like well-meaning. It's like the kind of stuff that a mother says to her child, right? Um, and 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 there's no like kissing on the lips or something. It doesn't make it like he he. It's not erotic. exactly. He doesn't. Well, if it yeah. is, he doesn't make it like a romantic thing. It's, so it's clear that it's operating in this sort of symbolic way like yeah. what is it to sort of um to lie with the saints or something you know what i mean like like i i but but, but yeah so let's let's keep talking about the detail of that that scene then but yeah i agree with you that that's probably the reason why it's easier to do it with aragorn than right with the character in this but 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 i guess that, sorry not to i don't sure. want to hit okay. on this too hard but like the I, i'm kind of, kind of curious like is it because the sacrifice has too much of a, it is recognizably of our world i guess like it, the world that it's creating is recognizably our own is it simply the fantasy sub creation distancing aspect no no i think it's it also sort of that like, that it's it's like that that it's an Im, impious thought to that to like to to too closely identify maria yeah. with with mary because um you know what 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 happens right he he goes into this story which i think was for me one of the most affecting moments of the film mm. uh where he he recalls uh having worked on his mother's garden she had this uh you know beautiful garden but it was overgrown it was very like untamed and he wanted to to tame it he wanted to um uh uh make it according to his own taste he says yeah and and by the end he's in tears recalling this story because uh having done all this work and taken a scythe to it and, and dug and all this he looks on it in kind of like it's, horror it's sterile yeah it's it's yeah. kind of been emptied of its beauty yeah. and 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 for me this was a very moving moment a very important moment because it it sort of speaks to our inability to set things right this is one of the lies of modern man is that oh you know technical progress and science like hmm. if if something's wrong we can fix it it's a great point uh, it's not true in the natural order it's not true in the supernatural in the spiritual order you know and and so so he's recalling this story but to me it's it's really speaking to how he just hasn't been able to write anything in his life that 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 his life is broken and that he needs a savior and so he appeals to maria and when she kind of uh you know like uh puts up some blocks like i don't know what you're talking about let's go back to your home whatever he he eventually puts a gun to his head um and and this is sort of the gesture that that uh that compels her now to take pity on him to begin to undress him and then undress herself and then we have this this levitating yeah. spinning moment of the yeah two and of if them. i can just point to a couple of details there there's a moment where he goes over to the bed 
to make this request don't you know please help us like and he's but he what he is actually doing is it starts uh, a shot panning down from the crucifix on the wall yeah and he's sort of kneeling be- yeah. before it at the same time as sort of kneeling next to her as she's sitting on her bed and um yeah and then yeah as you say she she comes back over to him after yeah. he you know is making a gesture of suicide and uh and so, yeah, I mean, we can talk about the details a little bit. I mean, first of all, I mentioned like this. It's funny that like this film got like did, there was like a PG rating displayed when you Google this film. But like it's it's definitely not. There's nudity in a number of uh, instances probably worth mentioning. But but uh, um, so, yeah, she 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 doesn't undress him totally. She takes off like his jacket. Right. Basically. And then she I don't think she undresses herself totally either. She like bears her breast basically. Yeah. And then. They lie down and there's this levitating sequence to sort of pan out and she's kissing him, but she's never kissing him on the lips. She's really kissing his face very tenderly. And then it goes to one of these dream sequences, which is like, I don't know, it's like sort of a ruined, dilapidated city kind of thing. Uh, And and but you're still hearing dialogue and sound from the scene that we've just left and you're seeing uh, I don't remember all the words, but it's it's. yeah. It's basically he. Well, just early, earlier, earlier in the film, there was this this the destroyed city street right. with a car. Yeah, and then now we see that same street, but now people are sort of running in a pan. There's life there. A, people are flooding out. Yeah, it's in a panicked kind of way. It and you also panicked or could be joyous. I think it's panicked. It's no, no, no. I, I, it looked like a. Uh, it could have been um, like like uh, grad graduation nah, day or something. It's panicked. Like, it's it's world ending <laughs> panic. Uh, <laughs> Even I've seen, but I even saw behind the scenes footage where Tarkovsky. They were running around. Tarkovsky yells from like the roof. He's like, "No smiling and laughing, please." Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but um, it was it was also not like screaming in terror, yeah. you know. Like it's- um, anyway, uh, so uh, you also see his son in that sequence, uh, the yeah. second version of that sequence. Yeah. Um, hmm. And uh, anyway, so w- what is she saying to him? You know, she's saying. Uh, um, he's saying like, he's saying like, no, fearfully, he's like, oh, no, I can't, I can't. And, uh, and she says, I forget everything she says, but at one point you hear her saying, come on, drink, drink this. And mm-hmm. so like, anyway, this, I, I'm going to link to this letterbox review because it's interesting as like an attempt to like maximally, like a maximally like Orthodox Christian interpretation of this film. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean this 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 guy. I've this is the only in, such interpretation that I've seen of this film of this scene. But he he says that it's not a sex scene, that it's actually a breastfeeding scene. But that like if he Tarkovsky had actually shown breastfeeding, like n- nobody would like be able to like handle that. So like <laughs> so uh, so so. But the idea being like this is this is a way that the Virgin Mary has been depicted in in the artistic tradition, right? Uh, and and it's also from scripture, you know, yes. um, not the New Testament, but the Old Testament. Um, right. Of, of, and uh, and so know, that is one possible interpretation you could you could have of the scene, which would of make grace it, being transmitted, yeah. you know, through this act of breastfeeding and of, and relying. Whereas before he's talking about his attempt to do something for his mother. In this case, he's allowing his mother, his to maternal do, character, yeah. to do something for him, and so. So if you want to interpret those th- that scene as being part of this whole sacrifice thing where maybe this is what is enabling him to make this sacrifice or something like that, then if you want to interpret them in tandem, then that's the way that you would want to read that – the scene with Maria, I suppose. Yeah, but what do you mean by juxt- interpreting them in juxtaposition? Well, because a lot of people's readings of this film is that he's giving us this pagan-like mysticism – Next to this Christian sacrifice imagery with him burning, not imagery, but the but the, the the idea of him burning down his house, offering it as a sacrifice to God. I mean, I guess you could say that that could be interpreted in a pagan or at least like a natural theology. Like, yeah, as well, but I still but don't understand like the juxtaposition that like, he's giving us these two th- these two different religious lenses, and they're not necessarily mm-hmm. to be interpreted as compatible, mm. uh, and that this that this character is maybe seeking out whatever he can to solve the problem, I see. but that we're not necessarily to decide which of these things actually worked. I see. Because we do see at the end of the film, things have gone back to normal. Not, not everything in the character's personalities or characters, because there are shifts that you see happening, yeah. but in terms of the world situation. Mm. Right. Um, and so something has worked. Is it anything that Alexander did? We don't know. 
is it which one of these things that he did? Is yeah. it going to the witch? Uh, because this re- reviewer also says he interprets he interprets a witch in the best sense as Tarkovsky not wanting to say the closest thing he's going to say to it's the Virgin Mary because he's not going to put that in his film because people won't accept it. This guy says a witch in the best sense is like, okay, she's a woman imbued with supernatural yeah. qualities. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and, yeah. And so... Yeah, uh, yeah I'd struggle to think yeah. that... that Tarkovsky is really trying to like smuggle the Virgin Mary in here. I think that right. that yeah. probably no, kind of he agree. wants there to be this openness to interpretation, you right. know. I mean, he, he says that, but but I, I get it. But I he get, is associating her clearly with exactly, his painting. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I, I Oh, and her 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 home is full of yeah, I mean, right, yeah, yeah. like she's she's she the lives in the church. Christian, Christian, right. uh, yeah, and it may be that for him that's, that outside. is the motivating that is the animating principle. Like this is a Marian character. I'm naming her Maria. This is how she's going to function. But you know, he doesn't he doesn't make it so easy as to just sort of be like, okay, well that's that. I think he he allows for this this yeah this interpretive space. So it's just one of those things where if you're trying to look for a non blasphemous or impious reading of that association, yeah. you're kind of le- I think it kind of pushes you in the direction of this sort of like breastfeeding idea that this, yeah. that this reviewer suggested. Yeah, yeah, yeah I dig that. Um, it's seriously even just talking about it, it makes me think like the fact that we're trying to like nail down the exact nature of the embrace you know is very western of us in a way um i think i think it's i think it's ma- i think it like you know i think it's a it's a worthy thing to to do and it makes sense that we'd wonder about it but um again knowing that Tarkovsky's kind of coming from the liturgical east um in his formation like there's a certain aspect of letting the mystery letting it remain and it's an embrace you know the exact nature of the embrace is is a mystery yeah but um, he, but it's also a, a choice Shrouded, right it's a know, choice like, that he makes too like he could have made that true. a a more sexual moment right because that's how i'm interpreting it until the moment arrives i'm thinking oh man where is this movie going right. like he's gonna go right. he's gonna go sleep with this witch like i don't like that <laughs> but then what happens is actually something quite different and so you know, when I'm when I'm talking about the embrace, I'm really talking about I'm really just trying to like deal with the image that we're presented with, you know, which is mm-hmm. it's 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 yeah it's, it could have been presented in any number of different ways. One of the one of the other things Tarkovsky says is that he says, um uh the result of Alexander's prayer is that he quote breaks irrevocably with the world and with its laws and puts himself outside all accepted norms. Um which uh, if you want to talk about the story of Abraham and Isaac. I wouldn't say that it uh, it puts Abraham outside of the norms of maybe other pagan religion of the time, which may have had human sacrifice, but it is one of those stories in the Christian uh, tradition that does seem to break us out of the accepted norms of Judaism and Christianity, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's something that people have continually found, found to be puzzling. And then more concretely in the story, you know, the, the ambulance comes to take him away to the funny farm after he burns his house do- down. Uh, and so that's 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 the sacrifice that he's making of himself more than his house is that now he's not going to be able to live normally with his family or in society anymore mm-hmm. because of because of this insane act yeah. <laughs> that he performed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's it's also worth um, mentioning, like the the Old Testament prophetic resonance it's like abraham is an obvious one um and the strongest i'd say but there's also the very strong it's the combination of that with job um with the idea of restoring restoring things he he explicitly asked for put things back the way they were you know there's this you know big big oh, the, the sadness totally, coming true you know totally. uh, uh which this is this merging of abraham and job there but then late in the film you know when he's carrying out a sacrifice he hits his knee on his desk and he starts li- he spends the rest of the film limping like jacob one other thing there's these other characters we're, we're not even gonna have time to get into like his wife and the doctor and the daughter a stepdaughter i think but uh i did want to bring up this quote that this life uh this wife the thing his wife says after she wakes up because she has this like screaming fit. It, it's it well as a side note. It's interesting just the contrast between his response and their response to the catastrophe is like his wife screaming hysterically. The doctor's response is to like drug all the women. Oh my gosh! And like including dr- injecting Dude, the daughter against. I was her having will. like PTSD, uh, man, because it just felt like way yeah. too much. Like 
the response to the all the COVID stuff. Right, right, right. Um, especially when uh, when the daughter objects, like, no, I don't need it. And he was like, no, you do. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't yeah, matter. it doesn't matter. Right. It'll, it'll be better for all of us if you take it. Right. <laughs> I was like, what does oh, that yeah. mean? That, yeah, she, and she's totally calm. She's not yeah. freaking yeah. out like her mother. It's, yeah, but it's yeah. like they, they just they sit around. They're in front of the TV. They're listening to what the government's telling them. It was just it felt like way too familiar, <laughs> you know. Right. Anyway, so after she like wakes up from her drug induced sleep, uh, his wife starts reflecting on you know, some of her personal issues and the fact that she's, I guess she's, she's been in love with their family friend, this doctor. Um, and she's speaking to the doctor and she says, um, we simply don't want to depend on anyone. When two people love each other, they don't love in the same way. One of them is strong, the other weaker. And the weaker is always the one who loves without reckoning, without reservation. And I, and I'm not bringing this up so much so we can discuss the character of the wife or their marriage, but just to, to bring it in because it's obviously relevant to this Tarkovsky quote that I that I gave at the beginning of this conversation yeah. about the theme of the twofold dependence of love and love being one sided. So, what do you make of his his claim of love being one sided? Uh, d- does that mean that like love is essentially something that like comes from above ultimately? Like love, like all the love that we have to give comes from God. Could it be interpreted? In, in something like in a sure. theological sense like that. Yeah, I mean I took it more to be um that love love has to be something that I do, that I take responsibility for. So it, you know, so often we conceive of love as being like a a quid pro quo or like, you know, a two-way thing. Mm-hmm. You know, they love each other, but I don't need you to love me in order for me to love you. Right. So in that sense, it's one. It has to be one sided. I have prin- to take like res- in principle. Yeah, I have to take responsibility for my love um, and my capacity for love. And so I think that that's what you see um, uh, uh, Alexander become. You know, someone who moves from being sort of you know self involved right. to now being capable of, of giving himself totally. Right. But, you know, it's interesting because if I can just quickly... But that's only after you re- receive from Maria, yeah. according to the reason yeah. that we're But if I can discussing. quickly digress, uh, I think that we're given clues that this is the kind of person <coughs> that he is because he's given things up before. You know, he, he, mm-hmm. he left his acting when it began to feel, mm-hmm. like, shameful or dishonest, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I think there was there was another example um, that I, I'm not thinking of right now, but 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 already we're given reason to believe that this is a guy who uh, has a capacity for you know like like giving something up in search for something more. But like he mm-hmm. said, like he says, he says uh, I've I've been waiting. Uh, yeah. Like my whole life, I've. When they get the bad news, he says, "My whole life has been one long waiting for this." I right. Think is the line, and so it's it's as if this is the crisis now, where where he where something is really demanded, like the line is really drawn in the right. sand. You know, the, uh, it's almost like, you know, it's just it's just how how conversion isn't isn't our work primarily conversion is a work of God. And so there's really no accounting for that moment when grace is able to like interrupt your life and, and, and reach you. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he recognizes that this is the moment where he can correspond to what's offered, you know? Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's interesting that reflects again, looking through the diaries um, last night, you know, there's some striking, there's a couple of striking passages in there where Tarkovsky's basically praying, saying, you know, uh, and I, I mean, I don't have it in front of me, but like basically, you, you know, it's just a very Augustinian kind of like longing comes through where it's this sort of like, oh Lord, how long will I have to yeah. bear my weakness? Yeah. You know, when will you relieve me? It's it's very, it's very psalmic kind of yearning. And you see that in the character of Alexander. I think he does pour that aspect of himself yeah, or his experience he's going through into Alexander in this, this is this someone who is at the beginning of the film is without faith, but you know, wants to believe yeah. at a deep level and, and is waiting for the opportunity right. to I, do so. But, but, but he's not having this like, um, 
like I, I think the parallel of Augustine kind of is helpful here in that he, like, and you see this in the, in the life of Tarkovsky as well. Tarkovsky is not a saint, was not a saint Augustine, you know, there, there, he, he lived a messy life. Um, but you know, we have every reason to hope that, that he, um, you know, made it in the end. Um, but, uh, there wasn't this like sort of clean break with the world in the way that there was with, with St. Augustine. And I think it's, uh, you can see him longing for that though, with, with this character in the, in the sacrifice who does make a clean break with the world. He does make that, that complete changeover. Um, I don't know if that kind of, I, I, there's resonances of what you're yeah. like that, that yearning is all through. It's, yeah, it's all and through it helped, his it helped life. me it's remember what, what struck me as like this second big thing that he gives up, which is his freedom in having a child. He describes this as, oh, as right. putting himself in chains. And he says, of my own free will, mind you. So he's, he's, he's talking about how his life was kind of empty before. Now it's much fuller uh, with, with little man. He's clearly in lo loves little man dearly. Um, but he, he still sees it as kind of ironic because so much of his life was about um, seeking this kind of uh, this like liberal uh, cultural uh, artistic freedom that now in retrospect it's 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 odd because he he put himself in chains with this child but he he he's quick to point out that it was of his own free will so again like here's evidence that this is a man who can will to give something up for the sake of something higher and so so he's on the path toward this enlightenment and he's able to respond differently i think uh than than everybody else around him because of the way that he's lived his life up till now even if it has been a life of you know some some mediocrity and selfishness and struggle and darkness and pain uh even hopelessness you know there's there's clearly something that's been motivating him to to take the steps toward this this big sacrifice. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. So I found this to be a very moving film, but also a very challenging film, not like challenging in the sense of, of Tarkovsky throwing the gauntlet down. I felt um, uh, exhorted to conversion. And I think that that's very cool, you know? And I, this would be a quick recommendation for me to anybody because despite its being sort of this like artsy, fartsy, Tarkovsky film uh, in Swedish, uh, I would sooner I would sooner recommend this to Instead someone of Russian, the language of the people. <laughs> I would I would sooner recommend this film to someone than Andrei Rublev. Um, what? Yeah. Um, oh and no way! Yeah, no. I knew that this was going to be a controversial opinion. Um, this is going to be. A I wouldn't even put this on the Vatican <laughs> no. film list. I I I I I may even prefer this to Andrei Rublev. Um, oh my gosh! On 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 a, on, a, on like a subjective level, I might I might be willing to say that objectively. Andre Lubov is a better film, but uh, but for me personally, I would sooner rewatch this one. Uh, you know, one reason is that it's it's significantly shorter, and that that does make a a difference. You know, it's like it's easier to watch in that sense. This is a film that, despite its odd and oblique elements, um, is actually very focused. It's very sharp. I think that 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 it tells. You know, I think that the once you see it a second time, mm -hmm. it's clear that the thematic material is like is pretty economical. Yeah, and and if you, and, if, and it's, especially if you give like your audience a little bit of priming, um, a little bit of orientation, I think that this is a very yeah. watchable thing. I do think that people would probably more more people would probably get something out of Andre Rublev than would like get something out of this film. Maybe I uh, I maybe yeah yeah I I just was very affected uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I I think it's great. I love hearing yeah, all that, great. James. Cause even though I, I disagree with you, but like I, I I love it because I I think the film is incredibly powerful and it's one that I've underrated for for several years. Even though like I last time I watched it, it was like 2014, and Letterbox tells me I gave it five stars, so I, I loved it back then. But my impression of the film since seeing it, you know, all those years ago, um, in my head it had kind of cooled down to this sort of like inferior yeah. Tarkovsky film. I, I and, quote, and I quote was... you as we discussed before you rewatch this film for this podcast quote, it's messed up. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you said because he was imitating Bergman and it was messed up for a greater director to be imitating a lesser one. No, but uh, see, I think he's my, leveraging. I think, he, and memory, I don't think it's just Bergman. I think he's yeah. consciously drawing on Chekhov and Ibsen and these these modern masters, as Bergman does. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. Go ahead. Well, I just want to say, I, th- I think, I think that's it. That's, 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 that's a big part of it. I was wrong in my assessment. You know, uh, it was a, it was a reductive, uh, I was responding to the, um, things that I, I had now to be clear, I haven't had my rehabilitation with Bergman yet. I've kind of gone through like a, a journey with Bergman. I'm still on the downslope with him. I'm hoping, you know, to maybe come back on the upslope with him someday, but there's a lot of negative characteristics of Bergman that, that I, that I, at the time I saw showing up in the sacrifice that I just did not think fit with what Tarkovsky is about. Mm-hmm. And now I can see more clearly that no, it is, it is thoroughly his through and through. Yeah. He's not simply imitating Bergman. He's really appropriating what, what he thinks works. And, it's, it's, and I think it works extremely yeah, and well. And I, I think it's better than Bergman, you know, like I like Bergman, Oh, uh, yeah, I, but yeah, you know, it's I like, agree. it's, yeah. it's, it's almost like what I wished Bergman was, you know? Um, and, and so, so that also excites me. Um, it ex- well, his world view, his worldview is simply different for Bergman sure, as well. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so. But, but yeah, I want to I want to emphasize. Sorry, just uh, um, uh, for me the I, I, just because you brought up Andrei Rublev, the, the I think it's worth making a comparison there. I think there are aspects of Andrei Rublev um, in an objective se- like the sort of the objective symbolic. Meaning, the, and I'll, just, the, the, I'll just say like the, the meaning of Andrei Rublev is something that I think is open to anybody who approaches it. You know, uh, the meaning of a sacrifice, I think it is there, but it's, uh, I would not recommend the film to anyone who hasn't seen a Tarkov, another Tarkovsky film before this one. And I would even suggest nobody should see this one. Like this should always be the last Tarkovsky film that somebody sees because he is such a personal filmmaker he puts so much of himself into everything, especially once you get into the 1970s onwards, that the best way to experience the sacrifice is to see it as the culmination of his, of his life's work. Uh, and really of, of his, the, yeah. the kind of the soul of an artist, you know? And I say that in, in that I think, and I'm being curious to get your take on this. Um, I don't know if the sacrifice works in a significant, significant way, uh, objectively the way Andrei Rublev does. Uh, where for me, the great, I was deeply moved yeah. by the sacrifice and I, I think it's a masterpiece, but it's a masterpiece to me in the sense that it is uh, in the way that it operates as the statement of an artist saying goodbye. The, you know, it's the summative work of him saying goodbye primarily to his son. And I'll just mention like the last five minutes of the film, you know, once we cut from the the burning building to his son watering the tree, I just wept the whole way, you know. But for me, that was an experience of, being brought kind of, I think into the kind of the relationship that, that he's expressing with his own son and, and all the things that were going on in their lives. Like there's kind of an extra cinematic context to the film that, that deepens the meaning of how he's sort of like yeah. passing the torch or saying goodbye to, to, to the, to his son through the film. To me, that's the most meaningful and, and moving part of it. The sort of the more, the more meditation on the religious aspect of sacrifice is, is, is there, but it doesn't hit me the same way. Mm. Um, so that's why I would say my recommendation would be to watch this last and, and then, and, and by all means watch yeah. it, but watch it, watch yeah, it last. That, may, that very well may be a good recommendation. Um, I, I will say that, you know, if you find that you're able to tolerate, uh, Tarkovsky, <laughs> um, and, and his, his style, then, then you shouldn't have any worries about approaching this one. I found yeah. it to be the most puzzling of the three films yeah. that I've seen by him. But on a second viewing, more more comprehensible. And maybe I just get it, you know, like I this is something I think we, it's great that you're connecting it with it yeah. in this way. I don't yeah. know that many people would. Yeah, and, um, and you know, I just just the the father son stuff was on a second was viewing I can too. see how it's thematically coherent, but yeah. it doesn't connect with me on the same way I, in the same way. I think partially I think partially because I, I mean I know Tarkovsky says in his book like that the 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 images and everything in this film everything works on a concrete plot level it doesn't have to be interpreted symbolically for me the film is far less appealing unless you have some kind of like viable symbolic interpretation of it yes yeah. because, because I don't mm-hmm. because I'm not necessarily willing to accept like 
go lie with a witch to end nuclear war right you know as like a, just a concrete like right, you right. know <laughs> solution <Yeah. laughs> you know what i'm saying so yeah. so i mean yeah sure if you want to make your own fairy tale logic but i don't i don't know that it even works so well that great as like a fairy tale on its own without like making it into an allegory of some kind so yeah um Whereas Andrei Rublev, anybody who's Christian or perhaps even someone who's not Christian who can just see it as a historical film, you know, can can sort of connect to it on that level and then build on that. Sure. You know, sure. Uh, yeah. And I think in a similar way, just with the structure of like editing and how, you know, um, I, I always find the first half of the film very hard to get through. Hmm. Um, now, not so much this time. This time I found it really fascinating, but that's probably because I was just able to approach it in a more analytical mode with like the whole modern art question and all that. But I, I find the film very dry, very yeah. austere in ways that it has other films aren't. There are parts and where I got bored it, in a way that I didn't with Andre Rublev. I, I wouldn't well, say I, took, yeah. I checked out, but... Um. Yeah, there are certain oblique... E there's just certain oblique moments I would say like that, that are, are just uh, like the stuff that was happening with the daughter, for example, right, sure. uh, yeah. you know, the chickens. Uh, that, you know, you just kind of have to go. Okay. Yeah. You know? um, and, but the thing is there are moments similar in tone to that in other films that he's done, but they, they flow. Like there's a certain flow. Sure. You're even if you don't understand what's happening, you're still kind of caught up in yeah. it. In the sacrifice, there are moments where I kind of dip out, um, because it just gets so oblique that I'm like, you know, yeah. but it draws me back yeah. in, you know? So for me, that, that is a sign kind of, of, I don't want to say inferiority, but that he's, he's, I don't think he's playing to his strengths mm. in that regard, but it, you know, it, it, I'd say it's worth it in the end. Like, you know, where he ends up is he ends up where he always ends up, which is giving his heart in some way. And that's, that's what I love about Tarkovsky. He is someone who is putting his heart all in on screen with all of its flaws and struggles and everything. And, and the sense that, that I, the sense that I get from especially the ending of this film is one of just overwhelming love. And as a filmmaker, I find it just utterly inspiring because why else are we doing this? You know, yeah. why else make films if, if it's not for love? Uh, and that was a great cross of his life. He made films out of a deep place in his heart and suffered greatly for it so well one more thing before we go is just i'm going to link people to the, a section of a documentary about the making of this film where <laughs> you see them shooting the scene where the house burns down because what happens is that what happened is that they were burning the house down and the, they were using one camera to shoot it and the camera jammed midway through the sequence and they found out just as the house was like collapsing that the, they didn't get the shot, all the shots they needed. And uh, and so you see that whole thing play out in this documentary. It's like a 14-minute sequence where you see them realizing it didn't work and then just like sort of standing around somberly. And then like you see them afterwards, they've built an, a replica of the house in like four days and are burning it down again and shooting it with two cameras this time. <laughs> and then you see them being like really relieved. It's just a great, it's a great sequence once they realize they've... Uh, They've yeah. got the shots. So next time we're going to do uh, The Leopard based on a, a beloved Italian novel, uh, Italian movie, uh, but starring Burt Lancaster, an American actor uh, in the lead role. So that should be fun. Um, and that's also on the Vatican film list. So uh, everybody, thank you for listening. Please subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And uh, if you'd like to help us out, keep making all of our different podcasts. You can go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time.